Good evening and welcome to the fourth Everett P. Pope lecture. I am Jack Abbott, Bowdoin class of 1963 and co-founder of the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society. Everett Pope was a member of Bowdoin's class of 1941. He was Phi Beta Kappa, captain of the Bowdoin State Championship tennis team. Major Pope, United States Marine Corps, was the recipient of the nation's highest military honor, the Congressional Medal of Honor, for his conspicuous gallantry on Peleliu in September 1944. Major Pope led his rifle company in an assault on a strategic hill and held it through the night of brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, using rocks and bare fists when ammunition ran low, his company repulsed numerous Japanese suicide attacks. Everett Pope was a long serving member of the Bowdoin Board of Trustees and is the only person ever to be awarded two honorary degrees by Bowdoin. The Pope Lecture was established by the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society in 2017 with the aim of bringing exceptional foreign policy thinkers and practitioners to Bowdoin in order to stimulate discussion and awareness of American foreign policy and national security. We are proud to honor the memory of Everett Pope with this lecture series for the benefit of the Bowdoin community. Past speakers of the Pope Lectures have been Ambassador Lawrence E. Pope, Major Pope's son and a member of Bowdoin Class 1967, General Anthony Zinni, United States Marine Corps, former Commander-in-Chief of United States Central Command, and C.J. Chivers, United States Marine Corps, Pulitzer Prize-winning author and longtime New York Times foreign co correspondent. Past lectures can be viewed on our website, www.bowdenmarinecorpsociety.org. The Pope Lecture is funded through the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society. The Bowdoin Marine Corps Society was formed in 2014 with three-part mission. First, we connect Bowdoin men and women who served or are serving in the United States Marine Corps. Our members range from Korean War veteran Don Hare class of 51 to current second lieutenant and flight school student, Jake Stenquist, 2019. Second, we assist the college in recruiting exceptional US military veterans to Bowdoin as students and support these student veterans through the Marine Corps Society Scholarship Fund. Third, we attempt to stimulate the college long and proud tradition of public service through this Everett P. Pope lecture series. It is now my privilege to introduce Gil Barndoller, Bowdoin class of 2004, and my co-founder of the Bowdoin Marine, Marine Corps Society. Thank you, Jack. Yep. I'd like to take a moment to honor a man who was a true friend of the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society. Ambassador Lawrence E. Pope, Larry to his friends, passed away on October 31st after a battle with pancreatic cancer. Larry was a distinguished diplomat and public servant and a credit to the college. In addition to serving as U.S. Ambassador to Chad and political advisor to U.S. Central Command, Larry came back to the State Department 14 years after his retirement to serve as a charge d'affaires in Tripoli after the Benghazi attack. As Jack noted, in 2017, Larry gave the inaugural Pope Lecture in honor of his father. Larry was so proud of the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society and its mission of supporting Bowdoin Marines and bridging the civil military gap. He believed deeply in public service and respected those who serve wearing a uniform or toiling in national and international government institutions. He once said, I tried hard to get my country to do the right thing. So he would approve of tonight's topic as we all try hard these days. The Pope fam family wanted me to express their thanks to all those at Bowdoin and beyond who have helped in the BMCS mission. Please join me in a moment of prayer or silence for Larry Pope. A couple of quick administrative notes before I introduce our speaker. 
First, the live transcript of our talk tonight is available via the CC button on your screen. Second, use the Q&A function on Zoom to ask questions of our speaker. And no need to wait until the end of his remarks to put your questions in. And lastly, for friends who are unable to join us live, tonight's lecture will be available on Bowdoin's YouTube channel by tomorrow morning and at the BMCS website shortly thereafter. Our speaker tonight, Elliot Ackerman, is a National Book Award finalist, author of the novels Waiting for Eden, Dark at the Crossing, and Green on Blue, and of the nonfiction book Places and Names. His work has appeared in Esquire, The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Times Magazine, and The Best American Short Stories, among other publications. An SCAT guy by way of Tufts, Elliot is a former White House fellow and a former Marine Infantry and Special Operations Officer. Elliot served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. His most recent book, 2034, a novel of the next World War, is a geopolitical thriller that imagines a naval clash between the US and China in the South China Sea in 2034, and the path from there to a nightmarish global conflagration. Elliot's talk tonight is entitled, Turning in My Card, American Identity and the Veteran Experience. We are honored to welcome him remotely to Bowdoin. Elliot. Thanks so much, Gil. Uh, thank you, Jack, as well, to the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society. Uh, it's a great honor to be delivering the Pope Lecture. But I thought I might uh, begin my remarks tonight with a joke from the generation that preceded mine in war, the Vietnam veterans, and it goes something like this. How many Vietnam vets does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, you wouldn't know, you weren't there. So with that, I'll begin. You know, identity in the American military is an enduring obsession. Long before debates swirled through cultural institutions about the value of hyphenated American identities or the relative fixity of gender-based pronouns, the US military had already determined that identity supersedes individuality. Within the ranks, the individual means little. He or she exists as a mere accumulation of various organizational identities, your rank, your unit, your specialty, all of which stand in service to the collective. This obliteration of the individual begins in training on day one, when every new recruit is taught a first lesson to, return, to refer to themselves in the third person. You cease to exist. You have become this recruit and you are taught among the many profanities you might hear in recruit training that there is one set of slurs that is most unforgivable of all. I, me, my. This doesn't last forever. When I served in the Marines, one of the first privileges the Corps granted me on the completion of training was the privilege to again refer to myself in the first person, except that I was no longer the same person. I was now Second Lieutenant Ackerman my military identity having eclipsed my civilian one. This new identity placed me firmly within the military hierarchy as a junior officer. And from this position, I would over years further build out my identity and thus my authority within the organization. I would pass through training courses that would give me expertise. I would go on deployments that would give me experience and I would gain in seniority, which would give me rank. When in uniform, I would literally wear my identity, the captain's bars on my collar, the gold parachute wings and combat diver badges that show I had passed through those rigorous training courses, as well as the parade of multicolored ribbons that at a glance established where I had served, if I had seen combat, and whether I had acquitted myself with distinction. All these colorful pieces of metal on my uniform serve the purpose of immediately establishing my place within a hierarchy, which is to say the military obsession with identity is not really an obsession with identity at all. It is an obsession with status and rank. And so it has become in the cultural hierarchy of America, where identitarians pursue an elaborate taxonomy of hyphenations 
and pronouns were the zealotry of drill instructors. Ostensibly, this new language is designed to celebrate individual difference. In practice, it annihilates the individual, fixing each of us firmly within an identity-based hierarchy that serves collective power structures. As a combat veteran, I have been the beneficiary of identity-based hierarchies for years, but this was not always the case. In April, 2004, I took over my first unit, a 40-man Marine rifle platoon. We were based in Camp Lejeune, waiting to deploy to Iraq that June. On a rainy day, when I asked some of my Marines to patrol around the base, practicing formations we would soon have to employ in combat, Sergeant Adam Bonatai, a super competent and at times super arrogant 21-year-old squad leader in the platoon, told me that he thought my plan was a waste of time. He had been to combat and I had not. Even though I outranked him, he sat above me in an invisible moral hierarchy in which combat sits as the knee plus ultra of status. I decided to respond to this minor act of insubordination. I brought Sergeant Bonatai into my office and had him sign a counseling sheet in which I marked him deficient in leadership. I explained that leadership required loyalty, both up and down the chain of command. By flagrantly refusing to follow orders, he had been disloyal to me and thus a bad leader. When I explained that I would place this counseling sheet in his service record, Sergeant Bonafi didn't like it one bit. He signed, as he signed, he said, what the fuck do you know about leading Marines, sir? I was leading Marines when you were still in college. Fair enough, but we still had to go to war together. Only a few weeks after the counseling sheet incident, out on patrol near Fallujah, my Humvee hit an IED. We were driving parallel to a long canal and I was first in the column of vehicles with Sergeant Bonatai sitting a few Humvees back. He later told me that from his perspective, I simply vanished in a cloud of dust and smoke. As hunks of shrapnel and earth plunked down into the canal, he was certain pieces of my body were among the debris. And in a macabre admission, later told me he imagined having to fish my joints out of the putrid water. What had happened was that two artillery rounds had gone off right next to my door. Fortunately, the rounds had been dug in too deep so that their blast fountained upward over my head, leaving me with dust in my throat and ears ringing, but little else. I then jumped out of my Humvee. Whoever had detonated the IED fired a few shots at us as I jogged back to Sergeant Bonatai. He and I worked together to coordinate our platoon's response in which we searched the area and eventually carried on with our patrol. After that day, everything changed. Our operations ran more smoothly with no complaints. During off hours, Sergeant Bonatai and the other NCOs came to my hooch to joke with me. We all got along. Several months and firefights later, I asked Sergeant Bonatai about that sudden shift in attitude. At first he laughed off my question. When I pressed, he became a bit sheepish, even apologetic. Well, you got blown up, he said. After that, we decided you were okay. You know, you were one of us. To this day, his words bring to mind a moment in Oliver Stone's platoon, in which Charlie Sheen's character, the doe-eyed new soldier, Chris Taylor, after being wounded in his first firefight, returns to his platoon after a brief stay in a field hospital. An experienced soldier named King takes him to an underground bunker. Here, the old hands are having a little party. When one of them, when one of them asks, what are you doing in the underworld, Taylor? King replies on his behalf, behalf. This here ain't Taylor. Taylor been shot. This man here is Chris. He been resurrected. At which point Chris joins their party smoking dope and singing along to Smokey Robinson's Tracks of My Tears, along with the rest of the platoon. It is an incredibly human scene and, you know, call me sentimental, I'm moved every time I watch it, as it traces my own experience of rejection 
followed by acceptance born out of combat. Chris's experience in the firefight has resurrected him. In the eyes of the group, the platoon, he isn't the abstraction Taylor anymore. His spilt blood has made him Chris, an individual. For a while, I resented Sergeant Bonatai's response. I was the same person before the IED attack as I was after it, no more or less competent. This need to classify me as other because I was not yet a combat vet felt capricious, indulgent, condescending, and so against the best interests of the platoon, which need a coherent leadership up and down the chain of command to run smoothly in combat. But of course, the metrics of identity are typically arbitrary and also typically they rarely serve the best interests of the group. Tribal by nature, identity fixates on difference, too often seeking to narrow as opposed to enlarge who merits membership in the tribe. Identity is as much or more a method of exclusion as of inclusion. It fortifies itself by casting others out. There's a famous Bedouin adage, which I first came across in Iraq. It goes, I am against my brother. My brother and I are against my cousin. My cousin and I are against the stranger. In this remorselessly reductive manner, through the accentuation of differences, as opposed to the assertion of commonalities, one group is pitted against another in perpetuity. In my case, I had power over Sergeant Bonatai because I was an officer. In his case, he exercised power over me for a time because he was already a combat veteran. Again, identity is hierarchy, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Eventually we returned from Iraq. Sergeant Bonatai left the Marine Corps shedding that identity and we shed the attendant hierarchy, the system of rank that had once existed between us. A few years later, when he invited me to serve as a groomsman in his wedding, I was still on active duty. He invited me to wear my uniform, if I wanted. I wore a suit instead to the wedding. We were now simply friends, resurrected, to use King's word, outside of identity and into individuality, where we remain to this day. When he returned from Vietnam, the writer Carl Morlantes went to work at the Pentagon in an anonymous desk job. He had seen the worst of war as a Marine, earning two Purple Hearts in the process. Then, slowly, his actions in Vietnam caught up with him, and he received several further commendations to include the Navy Cross, our nation's second highest award for valor. In his memoir, What It Is Like to Go to War, Marlantes writes about the experience of earning these medals. Quote, with every ribbon that I added to my chest, I could be more special than someone who didn't have it. Even better, I quickly learned that most people who outranked me, who couldn't top my rows of ribbons, didn't feel right chewing me out for minor infractions. I pushed this to the limit, end quote. Marlanti stopped cutting his hair. He grew a mustache that he describes as a scraggly little thing that made me look like a corn-fed Ho Chi Minh. Eventually, a more senior officer who had also been to Vietnam but had nowhere near my rows of medals, said Marlantes, called him into his office and quote, I don't give a fuck how many medals you've got on your chest, said this officer. You look like shit. You're a fucking disgrace to your uniform and it's a uniform I'm proud of. Now get out of here and clean up your goddamn act. Reflecting on the incident in his memoir, Marlantes writes, I can't remember the man's name. If I could, I'd thank him personally. He called my shit. It takes courage to call someone else's shit particularly when their externally verifiable identity trumps one's own. We all know when someone is tossing about identitarian arguments in order to evade the substance of a matter, confidently issuing assertions that cannot stand on their own logic, and so instead hoist themselves up on who, in some framework, they are. Typically, these special pleadings are spoken with that tired preamble, speaking as a in which the speaker telegraphs their intention to silence dissent through an appeal to identity-based deference 
as surely as if, they, as if they are standing on a golf course shouting four down the freeway. As on the golf course, the objective of the intervention is for everyone to get out of the way. Rhetorically and psychologically, identity is often wielded as a weapon. Some identities cut sharper than others. I am descended from Ukrainian Jews on one side of my family and Scotch-Irish Texan wildcatters on the other. The world perceives me as a straight white man, a dull blade if I'm hoping to cut with identity, except that there is one thing that corrects for my disadvantage in the identity sweepstakes and compensates for dull archaic status. I am a combat veteran. Suddenly my blade is sharp. I am owed deference and have the standing in the great American identity calculus to shut people up. Late in my military service, I came to understand how my identity accorded me such deference in certain situations. The ability to silence the dissent of those who might disagree with me when discussing, say, our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Some might argue that this is appropriate, that I've earned it. I don't think so. The authority of experience certainly counts for something, but should it count for everything? Should only those who have the authority of lived experience be entitled to raising their voice on certain issues, on race, on gender, or as in my case, on the critical issues of war and peace? Is Oliver Stone's platoon acceptable because he is a Vietnam veteran, while Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now is a work of cultural appropriation because Coppola is not? Must one have been to war for one's opinions about war to matter? Consider an obvious example of the interplay between identity and art. The Catcher in the Rye is commonly regarded as a work of adolescent alienation, but I would argue that it is more properly understood as a war novel. J.D. Salinger was a veteran of the Second World War who landed at Utah Beach on D-Day and fought in the Battle of the Bulge and in the Hurricane Forest and was among the troops that liberated the concentration camps. But generally, he did not take on the war in his work, as if he knew that a limit existed as to what he could directly convey. Yet the voice of Holden Caulfield, for which the novel is renowned, is one whose provenance I recognized after returning from my own wars. It is the voice of the cynical veteran to whom everyone is a phony. The vet who wants to visit the ducks in Central Park to recover to an innocence that will never return and perhaps never was. Take the novel's last line. Don't ever tell anybody anything. If you do, you start missing everybody. Those are quintessentially the words of a veteran. And yet Salinger scrupulously, as a matter of authorial intention, chose to admit his experience from his work, engaging with it obliquely. Do the new protocols of identity require that we put it back in? There is a philosophical problem here. How can you truly know what someone else's experience is or what access points he or she or they, speaking of ever more recent complex identities, bring to a subject. I am not suggesting that identities are necessarily false, but they are certainly subjective. And we need to think more critically about the authority of subjectivity in our society. A good place to begin such critical self-examination would be to propose that there are no classes of people whom we should believe as such. We must show empathy and make every effort never to begrudge it or hold it back. But after empathy, we must inquire after truth and evaluate the claims that are made on our conscience. Injury does not confer infallibility. Military veterans have sometimes misremembered the experience of battle and sometimes even lied about it. And they are not immune. Nobody is immune from correction, from being called on their shit. The appeal to identity as the dispositive consideration in any debate is anathema to an open liberal society. Yet here we are. I recall reading a column by David Brooks in 2015 when the tide was beginning to rise on identity. His column was framed as a personal letter of appeal to Tanahishi Coates on the occasion of the publication of Coates's Between the World and Me, 
a book that not only touches on the black experience in America, but also on the American experience itself and the validity of our shared experiment in creating a multicultural democracy. It is a book about its author, but also about all of us. Brooks did not agree with some of Coates' conclusions and his disagreement rattled him. Am I displaying my privilege if I disagree, he plaintively wrote? Is my job just to respect your experience and accept your conclusions? Does a white person have standing to respond? Those timid sentences are a kind of epitaph for free and candid and respectful and constructive discussion. Merlantes, when reflecting on his own standing as a decorated combat veteran, writes that, in the military, I could exercise the power of being automatically respected because of the medals on my chest, not because I had done anything right at the moment to earn that respect. This is pretty nice. It's also a psychological trap that can stop one's growth and allow one to get away with just plain bad behavior. This psychological trap is now the trap of our culture in which identity confers authority, a culture that not only stifles the interests in the individual by reducing him and her to a representative and a spokesperson, but also further isolates those groups whose interests it purports to advance. This has certainly been the case among veterans. Few groups in American life are more fetishized. We are elaborately thanked for our service, allowed to board planes in front of the elderly, and applauded at sporting events. Honoring us has become a secular Eucharist. Yet when it comes to the devastating issues that disproportionately affect veterans, homelessness, suicide, political extremism, most people look away. Our insularity, our otherness has done nothing to lift us up. In fact, it has hurt us. A citizen need only render their deference and then be on their way. Be wary of people who pay fulsome respect to your identity because what they are actually paying respect to is identity's twin, victimhood. The first time someone called me a victim was at a moment when I was very publicly engaging with my identity as a combat veteran. In retrospect, this correlation between identity and victimhood seems obvious, but at the time it was not. A group interested in international relations had invited another Marine and me to give a presentation about Iraq, specifically our on the ground perspective. This was a little more than a year after I had returned from the war. On that day, I wore my olive green service alpha uniform with its khaki shirt and tie. And before giving my talk, I was generously fettered around the room by my hosts. It was a distinguished group. And as we sipped soft drinks and nibbled hors d'oeuvres, I learned that certain of the people in the room held rather senior positions in government, or at least positions many levels above a Lieutenant of Marines. The presentation began and my co-panelist and I made remarks, showed photographs from our deployments, and did our best to describe the conditions under which the war was being waged. We answered questions from a moderator, the majority of which focused on the tactics of the war as opposed to its strategic utility. In short, we spoke only as junior officers with combat experience. Then, when answering a follow-up question, my co-panelists made a comment about the Sunni tribes in Al-Ambar province beginning to organize against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He regarded this as a positive development it contended that the United States needed to fully commit to this effort, which eventually became known as the Sunni Awakening, by surging even more troops into the country. He believed the war might soon turn a corner. Suddenly, we were not talking tactics anymore. We were talking strategy. And he had veered outside the lane prescribed by his identity as a combat veteran. He was now speaking the language of policy among those who held senior policy positions. Now, this was in 2006, a time when the war in Iraq was becoming extremely unpopular. When the moderator asked whether or not I agreed with my comrade, I said that I did. The moderator then solicited the next question. Hands shot up. An older woman went first. She asked how either of us could possibly defend the idea of sending more American troops to Iraq. My co-panelist reiterated his arguments that Al-Qaeda had overplayed its hand, 
that Sunni fears of Shia dominance in the newly formed Iraqi government created an opportunity that could undermine the insurgency, that it was worth making an effort to salvage the blood and treasure America had already expended. Did counterarguments exist? Of course they did. Did this woman engage us on the basis of those counterarguments? She did not. Her disagreement took an entirely different direction. She explained that we supported a surge because the war had made us victims. I'm very sorry for what you've been through, she said, but you are victims of this war. Given your experience, I have a hard time believing you can see the situation in Iraq clearly. Emotionally, you're too invested. Having made this declaration, she did not sit down, but remained standing in expectation of an answer. Politely, I explained that I was in no way a victim, that I had volunteered to serve in our wars and had volunteered again, I would soon leave for Afghanistan, that my opinions were rooted in my experience and my understanding of it, and that she was free to disagree with my arguments on their merits, but not on some specious claim that I was a victim of the very experience she had come here to hear me discuss, and therefore no longer able to think as an individual. The woman refused to relinquish the microphone until making a final point. Although she appreciated hearing an on the ground assessment from a combat veteran and continued to offer the somewhat obsequious respect that my identity commanded, I did not have her permission to repudiate the description of myself as a victim. According to her, the very fact that I refused to view myself as a victim was all the more proof that I was one, that the wars had damaged me. I had been blinded by my time at war to the wrongness of supporting any position except the swift and immediate termination of these wars, regardless of the actual conditions. Never mind that my support for a surge was itself based on my on the ground perspective. The only position that I could properly derive from my experience was one that coincided with her own. This incident has stayed with me, not because it was unique. On later occasions, I would again be called a victim but because it was the first time that my relatively new identity as a combat veteran had served to disempower me. Another combat veteran, J.R.R. Tolkien, who fought in the First World War, provides an analogy. In his Lord of the Rings trilogy, Tolkien writes about the rings of power, particularly the One Ring, which gives its wearer the ability to see and govern the thoughts of others but it also slowly erodes the wearer's vitality. In Tolkien's trilogy, the humble hobbit Frodo, whom Tolkien modeled on the common British Tommy with whom he served in the trenches, is the only one who can bear the one ring because of his pureness of heart. But even it calls to him and haunts him, robbing him of his strength and nearly spelling his demise. Identity, even an identity confirmed by a chest full of ribbons seduces in a similar way. It is a devil's bargain, not a heaven in which one serves a nobler cause, but a hell in which one reigns. When you wear identity, you can feel its power, but in the long run, it takes more than it gives, leaving you bereft of your personal difference, a golem enslaved to its service. To escape this system of doctrinaire social evaluation, we much, must each disarm. Is it possible to displace those who brandish identity as a cudgel from the center of our culture to its fringes? Now that would be revolutionary. This would involve us no longer deferring to a person's identity, but rather to their individuality and recognizing that individuality consists in more than the simple accumulation of sub-identities the sum total of all our group memberships. Veterans occupy an interesting niche in the politics of identity. As a group, our struggles are as real as those faced by other groups. The history of civil rights in America is also the story of America's veterans. And we too enjoy inclusion in legislation with special protections, much like those dispensed to racial minorities and other marginalized groups, including equal employment opportunity, access to housing and education, and protections from targeted crimes. The important difference is that we are not born veterans. It is an identity we come to later. We choose it. 
when I was beginning my military career as a college midshipman, my enthusiasm to become a Marine was boundless. I wore my hair according to regulations, though I was not yet required to do so. And during vacations, I found a way to volunteer for an internship gophering papers around the Pentagon. In certain ways, I must have been insufferable. That is why I suspect a recently retired Navy SEAL commander who worked a few cubicles down from mine as a civilian stopped by one morning. He stood well over six feet tall and had fought in Beirut, Panama, and Desert Storm before being forced into early retirement due to a parachuting injury. In some, he was an intimidating fellow who embodied much of what I hoped to become. Until that morning, he had never taken much of an interest in me. And with just the two of us in the office, he had my full attention. Can I give you some advice, he said. I've served with a lot of Marines, some good, some bad. Do you know the difference between the good ones and the bad ones? Sitting straight in my perfectly creased uniform, I didn't have a clue. And so he told me. The good ones never forgot who they were before they became Marines. Don't you forget either. I tried never to forget that advice when I went to war, but also when I came home. That is what I mean when I say that I'm turning in my card. I'm not going to stop being a veteran any more than someone from a specific racial, ethnic, or gender group will ever stop having the experiences that come with being a part of that group. But I will not allow this single element of my experience, this one personal attribute out of many, to eradicate the core of who I am. I will not play my veteran card in interactions with others, even if it's a very good card to play. And I will not allow myself to forget who I was before I became a Marine or any of the other identities, there were many, into which I was born. If I ever do forget the true core of who I am, however elusive it sometimes is, the self or soul that lies beneath all descriptions of identity, then please use another word to describe me. Call me lost. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. A uh, lot to chew on there. Again, welcome questions in the uh, in the Q and A function, the Q and A button down at the bottom of your screen there. But I'll um, I'll take moderator's privilege here, I guess, and start us off with a couple of things. Uh, Elliot, you spoke about America's unhealthy relationship with its veterans, the kind of the thank you for your service culture and the, and the sort of easy um, easy deference that that is accorded to certainly to post 9/11 veterans. I think maybe in a lot of ways, that's, that's a Vietnam hangover in response to an equally unhealthy reaction in the opposite direction towards Vietnam veterans. And, and of course, this country got rid of the draft in 1973 and has had an all-volunteer military since then and has now basically had 20 years of kind of low-level but ongoing, enduring kind of low-level, low-intensity wars overseas. Let me ask you kind of a big question. Is it possible for America to have a healthy relationship with its veterans with an all-volunteer force that, that has a very limited liability and only affects a small small percentage of the population and by choice, as you said. Sure. Um, when I think about it, I kind of think about it in, in, uh, in two ways. The first way is that, listen, if you, if you look right now at the relationship the U.S. has with its military, we have a very, very large volunteer military combined with uh, a brand of politics, which I think we can all safely say is pretty dysfunctional. So if you look back in history at the track records of republics that have highly dysfunctional politics, coupled with a very large standing professional military that is somewhat held apart from society, there's not a great track record there. So I think that is something that should concern every American um, it is an issue being large standing militaries and the role they have in a, in a democratic republic that concerned our founders, and it should concern us today as their inheritors, as we think about uh, that specific relationship. Uh, I would also add that you know, when we think about America and our history of wars, you know, every war that the United States has fought has had to be fought basically under a construct and sustained under a construct, right? We all have heard the stories of Washington crossing the Delaware, you know, reading Thomas Paine's common sense to his troops right before they were going to disband, saying, you know, these are the times that try men's souls. And what Paine was writing to him, what Washington was saying was, 
these are the times of finding souls because we need you to re-up for another enlistment so we can keep fighting the British. I mean, that's the subtext of that. Um, to the Civil War, the first income tax in this country is derived to fund the Civil War, you know, as was the first, as was the first draft. To a war like the Second World War, which is characterized by a truly national mobilization that was unprecedented at the time. To Vietnam, that was characterized by a very unpopular draft, and I would say largely ended because of the political pressures at home that that draft brought about. And that brings us up to our wars today, which have been constructed with their own unique model. These wars have been fought by an all volunteer military and they have been, sus and they have been sustained, sustained and funded uh, through deficit spending. There's no, there hasn't been a war tax. We, you know, we've put these wars in the national credit card. The result of that is that the American people have been largely anesthetized from these wars. Not because they're, not because they're bad, evil people, just because all of us, we behave according to our incentive structures. And if we're not asked to participate, uh, we don't participate. And that has created uh, misaligned incentives and I think has greatly increased the dysfunction that exists between the US body politic and its, and its military. So uh, I'm a veteran. I've, I've frequently heard sort of the conversations where some veterans say, oh, I don't like when people thank me for my service and others, others say that they do. I think what that, 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 that evidence is more largely is just that in, in our souls, we know that this relationship is dysfunctional uh, and, that, and that I myself believe it's overdue for a, a realignment. I'm someone who, uh, who would be supportive of a draft in some capacity in the future. Let me ask you about that. There's a piece you wrote and it's sort of a uh, sideline to your remarks tonight, maybe. I think it was in Esquire a while back. You, you wrote a short piece looking at the, this was during probably the tail end of the ISIS campaign and talking about, and I know you reported, obviously lived in Istanbul and, and reported on the Syrian civil war and the counter ISIS campaign. Uh, you talked about kind of people's bafflement that, that was expressed about bafflement about well, how could someone join ISIS? How could they do this? And you're, you're, I, I sum up your piece, you sort of said, how could you not get this? How could you not get sort of young men uh, volunteering for, a, for an adventure, however perverse uh, it, it may be and may look. Um, how much do you think your, your military service, you wanna call it identity, but certainly your service and experiences increase your ability to, uh, to have empathy across cultural barriers and even to, to have empathy or at least understanding of somebody in that position? Well, um... I think is a, uh, I think that what war does for you is it sort of radically widens the aperture of your experience as a human being, uh, both good and bad. I mean, one thing in my own wartime experiences, I saw uh, the most extreme, uh, the most extreme and virtuous expressions of all that is good in human beings. You know, the way people will sacrifice for one of one another, um, uh, and the things that people are capable for doing for doing uh, for their friends on the battlefield. And I also saw the most extreme versions of human depravity and the horrible things that we are able to do for one another. Um, so that, that obviously affected me deeply. Uh, and having had that experience being one that defined me, and that inevitably you, you start, as you're curious about those experiences and start interrogating them, you begin to ask questions, you know, who was the person on the other side? Who was I fighting against? You know, just as this experience defined me, I'm certain that it defined my adversary as well. And the two of us were engaged in a type of shadow dance. And uh, if you if you follow that thread long enough, uh, it, will, it will probably at least lead a person to want to have a deep curiosity and empathetic curiosity about who the person was they fought against. Um, you know, in my case, it led me as far as to sitting down and becoming friends with a, a, a former uh, jihadist who fought for al-Qaeda in Iraq and al-Ambar. Um, and the two of us wound up forming a, a friendship about 10 years later, so. Yeah, that was a, that's a great piece as well. I think that was originally in the Daily Beast and it was in your, uh, it was in places and names, right? Mm -hmm. I highly recommend people uh, tracking, well, both the book and tracking that essay down. Um, some questions from the audience. Uh, Sachin Maharaj asks, where did your college education fall short in preparation for the Corps? Where was it helpful? Um, I don't feel that my college 
expectation, uh, I did fall short. I, uh, I went to Tufts University. I studied history and literature. Uh, I think the joke was with a degree in history and literature, there's two things you can be, a history teacher or an English teacher or a Marine Corps infantry officer. Those are your two choices. Um, so all joking aside, I did not feel that it, it, uh, that it felt, sh felt short, nor did I feel my military training fell short in any way. Although I will say, uh, I didn't do many of the things I did in military training when I was in the wars, but based off of the training and the preparation I had, uh, I was well equipped to, uh, uh, to adapt to, you know, to adapt to those conditions. Um, so yeah, I felt, I felt very well prepared. Walter Adams asks, can you expand a little bit on the differences between a chosen identity veteran and unchosen marginalized identity like race or sexual orientation? Do you hold a different standard of discourse for veterans appealing to their identity than for those who cannot control it? I think the, the point of my remarks is that, um, well, first of all, you know, we none of us can control our identity. And I think the, the points of our, or my, or the, the thrust of my remarks are that solely defining ourselves based off of these exogenous identity metrics ultimately is not helpful and is deleterious some of the the, the, the empathy that you were just talking about before, because it, 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 it tends to have each of us fixate uh, on the ways we are different from one another, as opposed to focusing on the ways that we are the same. And by focusing on the ways we are the same, we're able to reach across boundaries uh, and, uh, and, and frankly, you know, live in a society that is more cohesive. Um, so, you know, yes, on the margins, maybe, there, you know, there, yes, I'm sure there are differences in, you know, the ethnic identity you're born in versus the, the identity you have as a veteran. Although I'll only speak for myself, I would say I identify probably more fiercely as being someone who is a veteran than being someone who's, you know, of a Jewish background, for instance, even though that's a, that's a part of my identity. Um, but I think that so long as, so long as, this is the metric that defines us. Uh, I think we are going to be as a nation stuck in a cul-de-sac that is not going to take us anywhere. And I think that much of the conversation today around identity is framed as being, as being progressive, is that it's gonna take us somewhere. And I view it as being wholly regressive. Uh, and I think uh, as, a, as a veteran, I felt both how identity can be wielded as a weapon and the ways that I mentioned how it can be used as something to turn you into a victim and completely disempower you. So uh, fire beware. Uh, Bowdoin professor Barbara Elias asks, says, thank you for a great talk under tough online conditions. How would you recommend a liberal arts college like Bowdoin address identity in the classroom? What do you suspect we are doing well? What do you think we could likely do better? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think that, I think that the, the, the greatest thing that we can continue to do and something that has made education in this country uh, superior for generations is, is diversity of views, is to push people intellectually. Uh, I know, you know, it was asked how my education helped me. I felt when I went to school, I was pushed intellectually. I was pushed to debate with people I didn't agree with. Uh, I, I got educated in an environment where we could have fierce disagreements and still all be off the word. Um, I'm not a college professor. Uh, I only know what I see second and third hand, but I'm, I'm concerned that we're losing our ability to do that. Uh, and I have children and I, and I see it in how they're being educated today. And so that if we lose the space to, to challenge ideas and to be challenged by our peers, you will not be getting an education. Sam Long asks about veteran culture. He says, veteran culture, the startups, the nonprofits that, that seek to profit from it, uh, has become increasingly strange and, and self-aggrandizing over the last 10 years. It seems especially uh, you know, kind of perverse and pronounced in the obsession with special operations units, particular units like the SEALs. And I know you, you spent some time in, in the then very young, I think you're probably like a, board, like a plank holder in the Marine Special Operations Unit, now the Marine Raiders. What do you think drives this? And do you agree it is a particularly unhealthy component of America's disturbed relationship with its veterans? Um, first of all, I think it's important to note, as we are talking about identity, that veterans are by no means a monolith. So, uh, you know, politically, experientially, I mean, veterans really, really run the gamut. I think I can intuit 
sort of the certain strain of uh, of veteran business or fetishization of veterans uh, that you're referring to. And yeah, that certainly concerns me. I don't think it's necessarily positive. I think the um, some of the fixation on Navy SEALs and things of that nature, uh, they, they provide a very skewed version to the American public of what the military is and who, and who veterans are and what they do. Um, and I think we are extremely susceptible to those skewed views because fewer and fewer segments of America's population are touched by the veteran experience and are touched by military service. And increasingly military service has become something that is more rarefied and, and intergenerational. Uh, and I think it's very dangerous for our country, for any Republic to have a professional military cast. Uh, so I, 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 do share, uh, I do share many of your concerns. Jake Stenquist, who's currently on active duty and, and at flight school in, uh, in Corpus Christi asks, says recently the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin ordered a safety stand down throughout the military providing a PowerPoint brief coupled with a discussion on combating extremism in our ranks. It included having members retake their oath of office as well as a lecture which described different forms that extremism can take, uh, you know, in person within units, on the internet and social media. You briefly touched on extremism in your opening remarks, but do you believe the military has an extremism problem? If so, how do we combat that? I believe the problem that the US military has or the problem our society has is in every single fact of American society at this point, I would argue, and I can think major institutions that have not already suffered from this has been politicized one way or another or is perceived by many Americans to have a political bias. Key institutions, you know, FBI has been politicized, CIA has been politicized. I would argue one of the very last bastions that has managed to avoid this politicization has been the U.S. military. I don't think anyone can say necessarily with a straight face that they know that the U.S. military has, you know, a, a real pol hard political leaning. Um, or at least in a partisan way. If we breach that wall, heaven help us. So I am, count me extremely skeptical of any initiatives going on in the Department of Defense that will be viewed as, uh, as having a partisan bias. Um, uh, I myself am very skeptical about every member of the US military. I'm, I'll only speak for myself. If I was in uniform and someone told me that I needed to retake my oath, I would frankly be a little bit insulted. Um, you know, I took it, I gave you my word once, you don't need it again. Uh, that's just me. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't many in uniform who maybe felt the same, the same way. Maybe there's many who don't. But at the end of the day, you're creating, I would argue, you're creating situations that you don't need to create that are highly divisive. And it's one thing when you're doing that at the Oscars or in a newsroom. It's another thing when you're doing that with the largest most well-trained, most highly equipped professional military in the world. You know, just don't, don't go there. Let me, let me follow up on that. Um, and I know this, this ties in a little, you had the cover story in, in Harper's Magazine just uh, I think this past month, looking at, at this increasing talk about political extremism and even people that speculate about a, a future, you know, the US sliding towards real open political violence and even civil war. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on why veterans, at least if we take one isolated incident, you know, a um, thousand folks, several hundred folks, the, the January 6th uh, riot insurrection in, in Capitol Hill, do uh, you have any thoughts on why veterans are, are overrepresented there and, and arguably by some statistical analysis overrepresented uh, in the ranks of political extremists in general? Um, I, you know, I'm really hesitant to, to necessarily jump uh, two conclusions. And I think when you look at the arrest numbers, I mean, like, yes, there is a slight overrepresentation of veterans in the arrest numbers, but I'm also very cautious of the idea that, you know, this plays into a lot of longstanding negative tropes about veterans. And those tropes only become more pernicious when they're being proliferated in a society that is, or parts of society that are increasingly removed from the American military experience. Um, but one thing I will add just on, on that point, which I sort of touched on in the Harper's piece is, you know, this issue of extremism or civil war will often come up and people will sort of roll their eyes and say, yeah, you know, everyone's going to pull out their AR-15s and, you know, this can't get too serious. And I, I cover the, Syria, the, the civil war in Syria for a number of years. And, you know, again, and this gets back to the idea of division in the U.S. military and the politicization of the U.S. military, you know, 
the, the precipitating incident that turned what was political violence in Syria into a full-blown civil war was when members of the military defected away from the Assad regime. And the reason that was such a catalytic action is because they take their gear with them. So, you know, it's what happened in our own civil war. When, you know, if you read the first person accounts, all of these officers are saying, you know, we don't want to do this. We really don't want to do this. Please, for the love of God, don't make us lose. And again, don't make, just do not ever make people choose in the military because we, everyone has a political bias and it's not gonna go one way or the other. Um, so we have to keep our military out of politics. And I think we have to look at the longstanding relationship we have with our military so that we can continue to keep it out of politics. Uh, Greg Johnson, retired Admiral, said that he found your argument compelling and he tries to understand why America so adores its military currently and whether that's out of guilt. Uh, and again, kind of a Vietnam hangover. Uh, he asks if the all volunteer force is becoming a mercenary force, isolated from the larger society, and being drawn from a narrower and narrower cross section of American society. Uh, should we have a system that has shared obligations somewhat similar to the national demographic, especially across all socioeconomic levels? National service after high school or college to include service in the armed forces. Um, I myself, yes, I myself, uh, as I think I mentioned briefly before, am. Uh, for a draft. Uh, I mean, I think it is important, it's important to recognize that the draft has meant many different things throughout our history. And you know, in the, the Second World War, over 50% of those who served in the Second World War were conscripted. The Vietnam War, which is the war probably most closely associated with the American draft, the level of actually about 75% of those who fought in Vietnam were in fact volunteers. So yes, the draft is important, but it, as important as national service is, what is equally important is the specter of national service so that everyone is engaged with these issues because they know it may be my son or my daughter who is going to go. You know, I have a 15 year old, a 14 year old, you know, what are we doing? In uh, I assure you that these debates would be far more front and center in the national conversation if national public service existed. Sage Santangelo, who's a Bowdoin Marine as well, she asks, how do you think the services and their leaders can better assist in creating a healthier identity for their service members who will all be future veterans? Oh, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's a great question. I think one of the, you know, one of the great challenges that I've seen amongst uh, my generation of veterans is, you know, the ones who have really struggled are the ones who have not been able to find a sense of purpose in their life that fills them up the same way they felt filled up in the military. You know, the military gives you um, a very intense and clear sense of purpose and very clear and intense sense of identity. As I mentioned, I mean, you literally wear your identity on your uniform at a glance. Everyone knows who you are and they know where you fit in the hierarchy. And when you step out of the uniform, that no longer exists. Um, so the loss of identity and the loss of purpose uh, can be a struggle for many. And the struggle is how do you reconstruct that identity and how do you reconstruct that sense of purpose in your life? And the people I know who've gotten out of the military and have thrived have been very, have done a good job of, of doing both and doing both in a deliberate way. The people I know who have really struggled of, uh, for too many of them central to that struggle were those struggles with purpose and identity. So I think, listen, veterans staying in touch with one another, I think great nonprofit groups um, that do work with veterans, uh, groups like you know Team Rubicon and others, I think have taken a very creative approach in understanding this psychology and understanding how veterans want to continue to serve. Um, but it's, it's going to be something that has always challenged veterans. And I think will always challenge veterans uh, just given the nature of the experience uh, and particularly when uh, when there's combat involved, I think. Do you think, uh, for Sage's point, do you think that the, the service themselves and, and military leadership can do a better job as uh, men and women are getting out of uniform, you know, while they're still finishing up? And you and I probably went through a similar TAPS, TAMS, TRS transition, kind of, you know, slap on the butt as you're heading out the door and get ready for college or civilian life. Is there, is there more that can be done in the ranks before people leave service? Yes, to a degree, but I do think it's also important to, to recognize that the mission of the United States military is not to help transition, veterans transition into society. That is actually the mission of society. 
to let the to, to to allow the veterans to return. Our military, you know, fights and wins our nation's wars. Um, that it's actually incumbent on society, all of us, to bring the veteran back in. And when society is disconnected from the wars, uh, ambivalent about them, not paying attention, uh, that's I think that is the the transition that's so difficult. So. Again, I, you know, so, so yes, I think there's great things the military can do to help people with jobs in that first transition. But most of the people I know who've really struggled, it's not kind of because they didn't have that first, you know, those first few strides out the gate didn't work. It's a year, two years, three years later. And I don't place, you know, I don't, I don't put the deficiency on, you know, the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps. In that case, I put the deficiency on the United States of America and our society. I've got one final question. We're wrapping up actually a little bit late. I apologize. We've got a few folks whose questions we didn't have time to get to. But Phil Cantor asks, building on the topic of identity, how do you see identity intersecting with questions of national security? I worry that an increasing focus on identity of all stripes, as you said, including increasingly strongly held political identity, has the potential to prevent us from coming together in a time of true crisis. I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, so much of this identity conversation is incredibly corrosive to a, a sense of national unity. Um, you know, I remember before this pandemic, sitting around with friends at dinner or at a drink, and you know, particularly, you know, over the last you know four or five years, as our politics have become incredibly divisive and incredibly partisan, just sort of wondering among friends, like, wow, geez, you know, I wonder if there were like, if a 9-11 happened today, if the country would be able to kind of come together as we did in 2001, you know, at least for a year or two and really unify to deal with that type of threat, or if we're just so far gone, we're too divided to deal with that. Well, guess what? 9-11 showed up. It showed up this year in the form of a, of a pandemic. And I would argue this past year was one of the most divisive years we've ever experienced as America. And I think that should cause us to do some real soul searching, particularly as we think about our place in the world and whether or not we would be equipped or correctly postured to deal with uh, an external threat. Um, so yes, I, I, I very much agree with that question, which was also a statement um, that the, our current framework for understanding identity uh, in many respects runs counter to us having a national identity of which we can all be proud of. And if we don't have that, um, you know, I'm just a dumb old Marine, but I don't understand how we have a country. Well, on that, on that cheering note, we're gonna wrap up tonight. Elliot, thanks so much for joining us. This was, uh, as I said, a really uh, stimulating and interesting hour and uh, an honor having you here as our, as our fourth, uh, fourth lecturer. Thank you, the honor's mine. Thank you so much. <laughs>